Thank you for joining us for Face the State. I'm Tracy Townsend. We're going to start this morning with a look at the Larry Householder trial surrounding that House Bill 6 scandal. The first step started late last week. Householder is accused in one of the largest bribery schemes in our state. It centers around his time as Speaker of the House, dark money and first energy. David DeVillers was the U.S. attorney when charges were first announced in 2020. You just saw him on screen. We talked with him this week about what to watch for in this case. The one thing jurors always do is follow instructions. And if those jury instructions are, are, are and I'm sure they will be, Judge Black is, is the judge, um, follow those rules, then a just verdict will happen. We also asked him about why you should be watching this big case very closely. Anytime we're talking about the rule of law, the public should care. Everything begins and ends with rule of law. And without rule of law, we don't become a state. We're not a government. Regardless of the outcome, that people understand a little bit more about dark money groups, a little bit more about quid pro quo, and, and kind of learn from this. And, and I, honestly, I think a lot of politicians and, and political figures have learned about this. And even if they have the, the, the right heart, there's certain rules that they need to follow. And, and hopefully, uh, it's, it's brought some attention to those rules. There are years of history related to this particular case. 10 TV's Andrew Kinsey now walks us through how we got here. Let's start here. First Energy had been asking Ohio lawmakers for money for two nuclear plants. According to the FBI, First Energy routed more than $60 million to 501c4 groups. The complaint doesn't directly name or charge First Energy, instead refers to it as Company A. Here's why this is important. 501c4s are not required to reveal their donors, sometimes referred to as dark money groups. According to the complaint, those groups were controlled by then Ohio House Speaker Larry Householder. Allegedly, Company A sent most of the money to a dark money nonprofit called Generation Now to support candidates Householder chose, in turn helping him win his bid to Ohio House Speaker. In 2019, Householder earned that title with 26 Republicans and 26 Democrats. Shortly after House Bill 6 is introduced, it provided a billion dollar subsidy to fund the original two nuclear plants. It passed the House and Senate, and then in July of 2019, Governor Mike DeWine signed it into law. The complaint lists a number of dark money groups, including Generation Now and political action committees where money was allegedly sent. That is not illegal, but what is unlawful is how the money was allegedly spent. One, to get Householder elected and elect others who would help him acquire the subsidies. Two, the FBI says Householder used the money for personal benefits, like paying off a lawsuit and to fix a house he owned in Florida. And three, it alleges money was used on advertising and other efforts to pass House Bill 6. As a result, Householder and four alleged co-conspirators were arrested and charged in a racketeering and bribery case. Two of those men pleaded guilty. A third, longtime lobbyist Neil Clark, died by suicide. Three months later, Householder is expelled from the Ohio House. Only Householder and former GOP chair Matt Borges have challenged the case against them. That was Andrew Kinsey reporting. You can count on 10 TV to keep you updated every step of the way during this trial. Look for our coverage right here on air and at 10TV.com. One sports betting company now has to pay up. The Ohio Casino Commission voted to fine Caesars $150,000 for breaking advertising rules. Caesars is one of several gambling providers accused of using the words free or risk-free or by having gambling prevention messages that were either too small or missing altogether. This week, representatives from Caesars told the commission what they did after learning about the issue. We immediately reached out to the affiliate. Uh, we alerted them to the findings that you had uh, provided us, uh, and we terminated our relationship with that affiliate, not only in the state of Ohio, but uh, nationally. 
Now, as far as the other companies accused of breaking the rules, PlayUp and Penn Sports Interactive are waiting on a hearing date. DraftKings and BetMGM haven't requested a hearing. They have a couple of weeks to still do that. All of the advertising rules are meant to cut down the risk of gambling addiction. If you or someone you know needs help, there's a 24-hour hotline you can call. The number is right there on your screen, 1-800-522-4700. There is concern over state voting changes recently signed into law. The Franklin County Recorder pointed out that a law makes it so that even veteran IDs handed out by their office won't work at the polls. What we have to do is, you know, we might possibly have to reach out to all these veterans and say, hey, this ID law that was passed, um, it, it, it'll negate your ability to use that veteran ID card that you got same day from our office, uh, you know, a few years ago. The one that you've used to vote in the 2018, 19, 20, 21, and 22 elections. Now, under this new legislation, you can still use a U.S. military ID, Ohio National Guard, or U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. The law also eliminates early voting on the Monday before Election Day, eliminates most August special elections, and shortens the deadline to apply to cast absentee ballots by mail. Now, when we asked the governor's office to respond to the concerns, that office redirected us to the bill sponsor. Secretary of State Frank LaRose told 10TV that any voter can vote absentee without having a photo ID. When we asked his spokesperson if LaRose, the Secretary of State, would interview, do an interview with us about this issue, we were told no and then redirected to the Franklin County Board of Elections and the bill's sponsor. So we'll continue to follow that. There is a push to make more people eligible for medical marijuana in our state. Senate Bill 9 would add more qualifying conditions, including arthritis, migraines, autism, and chronic muscle spasms. This bill also aims to create a division of marijuana control as part of the Department of Commerce to provide licenses and to oversee dispensaries. Here's what the bill's sponsor said before committee this week. To me, this bill is about business. Uh, and, and in medicine, the number one thing is to keep your patient's um, best interest in mind, and that, was, that is what this bill does um, from a business aspect. We also, in this bill, expand the number of medical conditions that are eligible for marijuana, medical marijuana, and we also give the discretionary authority to the physician to work with his or her patient to figure out what is in the best interest of the patient. There's also a piece of legislation that would allow Ohioans to make and consume their own moonshine without a permit. It's Senate Bill 13. Under the bill, you aren't allowed to sell the moonshine, and a household of two or more people can make a maximum of 200 gallons of moonshine a year. A similar piece of legislation has been introduced before. It did not pass. Senator Sherrod Brown will have competition this next election. Ohio lawmaker Matt Dolan announced he's going to run for U.S. Senate. He's the first Republican to enter the race. Dolan, as you may remember, is from the Cleveland area. Last year, he ran for former Senator Rob Portman's seat and lost. J.D. Vance, who former President Trump endorsed, won. We did ask Dolan if he thinks that will play a role in the election next time. I am my own person. Uh, I run on what I believe is the best for Ohioans, and I don't rely on outsiders uh, to, to set the direction of my campaign or become dependent upon it. I will continue to do that. All the reasons I said, I, I have the, the experience in the public and the private sector. I have the re uh, conservative record that has produced results. I can prosecute Sherrod Brown, and I can actually get things done in Washington, which is what Ohioans really want. Who has control over your child's classroom could change. We're going to take a look at a new proposal aimed to take away power from the State Board of Education. And the amoxicillin shortage is now hitting parents hard. Ohio Pharmacists Association explains why you can't find the medicine you need. Welcome back. There's debate in the State House about the future of the Department of Education and the State Board of Education. 10TV's Kevin Landers looked into the plan to create a new education entity that would be controlled by the governor's office. That the current structure is failing our kids. In the eyes of some Ohio lawmakers. But well, we've got systemic problems that need to be corrected. And Ohio schools aren't getting the job done. 
and last year nearly a third of students were chronically absent, including almost half of all African-American students in the state. Enter Senate Bill 1, which would do away with the Ohio Department of Education and create a new office called the Department of Education and Workforce run by the governor's office. It will consist of two divisions, the Division of Primary and Secondary Education and the Division of Career Tech Education. Supporters say too much emphasis is placed on ACT and SAT scores and not enough on teaching children about developing a trade, especially those who can't afford college. As a parent, I would want to know specifics. If you're going to take over, you tell me what that's going to look like in a district. And honestly, I don't think they can at this point. Opponents of SB1, like Ohio and Department of Education board the member the Antoinette Miranda, says the bill lacks ads. specifics. It lacks details how the legislation will raise test scores. She questions how it will improve attendance, improve math scores, or increase accountability. But if you press them on what is this going to look like at the state level in the governor's office, they cannot give you an answer. And that to me is really scary. The bill's sponsor was asked exactly how it would improve accountability to improve schools. It would be up to the new uh, department to basically reevaluate re re the system on how we would do that. That was 10 TV's Kevin Landers reporting. Opponents also say they're concerned about what this bill could mean to the pool of candidates who want to be the new superintendent. Under Senate Bill 1, that position would not have the power it has right now and instead would be more of an advisor to the new Board of Education. The topic of LGBTQ student rights is something the State Board of Ed talked about last year. It's also the center of a lawsuit filed this week against Hilliard City Schools. 10 TV's Bryant Somerville talks with a mother and plaintiff in this matter and gets a response from the school district. Where do you fall on this argument? Well, I'm one of the plaintiffs. Lisa so, Chafee, um, the Director of Parents' I Rights and Education for Ohio and mother of a Hilliard five, District student, five, says five, after trying to work with the district to no resolution, Tuesday's lawsuit against Hilliard City Schools is a necessity, saying parents should have the right to know what is happening with their child. If a parent is denied the knowledge that their child is having mental health issues, no matter what the reason, they are robbing that parent the opportunity to shower their child with the unconditional love and support that the majority of parents do and that all children need. She says a handful of teachers and administrators at HCS are using recommended changes to Title IX dealing with extra protection for LGBTQ students as a platform to not share critical information with parents. They are using those proposed changes to write policy to say it's because of Title IX that we can't tell parents when their kids are having gender dysphoria or if they happen to be a member of the LGBTQ community and having mental distress, they're afraid to tell the parents. Chafee is one of eight plaintiffs on the lawsuit. Wednesday, the district responded to that suit. Superintendent David Stewart saying the district is committed to a transparent and vigorous defense against this lawsuit, which is notably filled with misstatements of fact and mischaracterizations. It also calls out different mentions from the use of surveys asking for student pronouns, badges worn by teachers for LGBTQ students with objectionable material inappropriate for students that are now covered, and the role of counselors versus teachers. There are no. going to be some, though, Lisa, who say the reason we are seeing this lawsuit, the reason we are hearing about these issues is because this group of right now eight plaintiffs, mm -hmm. right wing, that's why we're seeing this. What do you say to that? First of all, as I've always said, I'm not anti anybody. I love all kids. Superintendent Stewart says making broad brush accusations such as these in this lawsuit detract from the district's mission and the educational efforts of our dedicated staff and teachers. Chafee believes she, her group, and the majority of Hilliard educators want the same thing, for students to feel valued and safe. Bryant Somerville, 10 TV News. Chafee says plaintiffs are willing to sit down with the district for a compromise, hoping to keep this matter out of the courts. The district's administrators say it looks forward to filing its response in court. We will certainly continue to follow this and keep you updated every step of the way.
$48 million in federal grants going to child care and education in our state. According to the governor's office, the money will be used for child care worker training, expanding child care for those with special needs, and increasing awareness about help that is available for families. Across the state, parents are searching for amoxicillin. Kids and parents fighting off respiratory viruses and the secondary infections are feeling the worst of it. 10 TV's Lindsay Mills asked the Ohio Pharmacists Association what's behind the shortage. Here at the Sheber Family Pharmacy in Circleville, the supply of amoxicillin was critical up until about two weeks ago. It's frightening to think about not being able to have a child that's suffering and not be able to get an antibiotic. As a father and grandfather, Larry Sheber knows the stress a shortage can cause a parent to feel. As a pharmacist owning this shop for more than 30 years, he also knows shortages are nothing new, but he says they've never been this significant when it comes to a common antibiotic. Amoxicillin is in short supply. The FDA expects it could be the case for months. Why? It's in high demand. With the surge in RSV and flu cases this fall, there were a lot of secondary infections that required this antibiotic for treatment. And according to the Ohio Pharmacist Association, a few key chemicals used in pediatric formulations sourced from abroad are not able to be shipped in time to meet demand. The number of times that we've seen shortages that affect um, critical medications, um, it continues to be a, a problem. Pharmacists agree this points to a bigger problem, the supply chain. This has really underscored the, the vulnerability here, and I, I'm hoping maybe the FDA will take a look at this. So what can you do if you can't find what you need? For amoxicillin, ask your doctor or pharmacist for an alternative antibiotic. Or ask if there are different doses, concentrations, capsules, or tablets that could work. Whatever it takes to get the patient taken care of. And for now, the amoxicillin shortage is slowly subsiding here in Circleville. But as you can see, they're still feeling the effects of shortages of things like ibuprofen and children's Tylenol, those over-the-counter medications. In Circleville, Lindsay Mills, 10 TV News. The FDA has a full online database of medications that are impacted by shortages. To check to see if your medication's on that list, check out the link on the 10TV app. The Ohio Attorney General is focusing in on a possible environmental mess. The smell sometimes can be horrific. Ahead, why Dave Yost is looking into a large spill that left a foul smell. The Ohio Attorney General is asking a farm owner in Morrow County to stop what it's doing, arguing that it could pose a hazard. This comes after an environmental spill last month. Chief investigative reporter Bennett Haberly explains what comes next. For years, neighbors living near this Morrow County farm have complained about foul odors and raised concerns about what's happening here. It, it just goes on and on. If it's not this spill, it's something else. It's the trucks, it's the smell. Yeah. We feel helpless, really. 10 Investigates first reported on a company called Renergy back in 2019. It has operated on this farm for years, collecting animal manure and other waste, placing it in the digester, which then helps create electricity. The leftover waste product has been spread on the fields as fertilizer. But last fall, Ohio's EPA and the Ohio Attorney General's Office accused the farm and those who operate it of taking in too much material and improperly storing it in these tanks. The farm owner told 10 Investigates they're still making repairs to their operation, but declined to comment further. The torn up earth is what's left over from an incident four weeks ago. The problem was that back on Christmas Eve, the digester behind me malfunctioned and 150,000 gallons of manure and other waste products spilled on the neighboring properties. John Dobikin lives across the street. He showed me a sample of the material he collected in this mason jar from the thousands of gallons that had to be cleaned up from his property. That's it, huh? That's it. Building something like this uphill from everything draining it down to the river, it's, uh, I don't know, a mess. I asked John and his wife Carol what are their outstanding concerns. Contamination of water, for one thing. Of course, our front yard is full of, the word would be, you, you aren't going to want to hear the word I would say, but it's a short word, you know, it starts with an S. Uh, yeah, I've got, we've got kids and stuff around here, and it's, this has been our home. The smell sometimes can be horrific. Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost's office has asked a judge for a preliminary injunction, seeking to stop the farm from activities that the state alleges threaten public health, safety, 
and the environment. In Morrow County, Bennett Haberly, 10 Investigates. The farm operator, Alex Ringler, said he would have a public, public relations firm they work with contact us here with further comment. We'll certainly let you know when we hear back. Ohio lawmakers in Washington are pushing for better protection for mail carriers. And this comes as we are learning about more reports of postal workers getting robbed on the job. The crimes aren't tied to one location either. And it's not just an Ohio issue. 10 TV's Kevin Landers talked with a local mail carrier who says he's worried about his safety. Hey, Mr. Honey. Zaire White is nearing his seventh year as a mail carrier. I'm out here by myself for about 10 hours out the day. Alone and now concerned. It makes you scared and nervous and stuff like that. It's talking about a series of mail carrier robberies on the job like this incident in German Village in late December. When they come up with us with guns or whatever it is, just give them what they want or what they ask for. Don't try to fight for it. He showed us what thieves are after. It's called an arrow key that can open these blue collection boxes. This little key right here, uh, they just want this. That's that's literally all they want. So we're trying to figure out a way to, to make it to where we don't have to carry these keys around us. Mail carrier safety has reached the halls of the nation's capital. In response to the latest mail carrier robbery, we contacted Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, who told us this is unacceptable, and I demand action from the Postal Service leadership, including the resignation of Postmaster DeJoy. She's not alone in calling for security changes for mail carriers. Last year, Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown sent this letter to Postal Inspector DeJoy asking him to reinstate patrolling duties of postal police officers in the face of increased widespread, costly and dangerous armed postal robberies and mail theft. That request came after it was learned that USPS changed their patrols and, quote, restricted the presence to postal facilities while prohibiting them from patrolling mail carrier routes. As for Zaire White, he says retrieving mail from these blue collector boxes are not on his route. However, he told us the post office has already changed how mail is collected here. We don't go to those on uh, like an everyday basis. Is it because of what's happening? It's because of what's happening. That was 10 TV's Kevin Landers reporting. The Postal Service says it's working to improve security of that blue collection box system. They're testing some new security locks, and it says it's deployed additional postal inspector personnel to areas with higher letter carrier robberies and mail thefts. This week, we honored the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Columbus is home to the largest MLK birthday breakfast in the U.S. It was my pleasure to MC that event. Each year, the speakers are invited to have some tough conversations about civil rights, religion, and educational goals. It also includes several major political leaders from our state, including Congresswoman Joyce Beatty. And during her speech, she touched on the drawn out price process to vote on a Speaker of the House. At this great inflection point in our nation's history, I urge every one of you to hold on to those words and use it as a clarion call because what America witnessed last week, four days and 15 rounds to elect a speaker of the United States House was confusing and chaotic. It was not intelligence plus character. So I say to all my friends and colleagues, let us remember democracy and justice and freedom. And we certainly wish you a great week. We thank you for being with us today. And we say, who day? Go Bengals. <laughs>